GCON. Sardar Lambade, President of the Senate, Chairman of the National Assembly, Chairman National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies Governing Council. The guest lecturer for the 2022 Distinguished Parliamentarians Lecture, organized by NEILS, Your Excellency, of the Right Honorable Femi Bajabia Mila, CFR, and alternate chairman, National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. The distinguished chairman of this occasion, Your Excellency, Malam Nasir Erufai, CON, Governor of Kaduna State, chairing this event. Principal officers of the Senate, principal officers of the House of Representatives, distinguished senators and honorable members of the House of Representatives present, the Honorable Minister of State for Works and Housing, Honorable Omar Ibrahim El Yaqub, the Executive Chairman National Assembly Service Commission, Engineer Ahmed Kadi Amshi, fellow Nigeria Society of Engineers represented by Engineer Etuk Olushegu, and commissioners from the Commission. The clerk to the National Assembly, architect Ojo Latunde Amos, leading the management of a National Assembly team to this event. The chief convener of this event and helmsman of the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, Professor Bakar Olariwaju Sulaiman and members of the management committee. Heads of departments and agencies of government present at this event, my lords, gentlemen of the judiciary, your excellencies, members of a diplomatic community here present, your royal majesties and highnesses, captain of industries, heads of civil society, organizations and NGOs present, distinguished participants at this year's annual lecture series of the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, ladies and gentlemen, of the fort estate of the realm, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Director General, National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies and the management team, I welcome all of you to the 2022 Annual Distinguished Parliamentarians Lecture. The topic for this year's lecture is delivering on our contract with Nigeria implementing the legislative agenda of the Ninth House of Representatives, progress, challenges, and way forward. The presenter at this year's annual lecture is none other than His Excellency, the Right Honorable Femi Bajabia Mila, CFR, Speaker of the House of Representatives and Alternate Chairman, Niels Governing Council. I'd like us to please applaud all the distinguished gentlemen and our distinguished lecturer at this event. If you recall, last year's edition it was the President of the Senate and Chairman of the National Assembly who was a guest lecturer. The topic is in line with the aspirations and the dreams that the Speaker of the House of Representatives has as part of his agenda for the House of Representatives and the entire Nigerian populace. It is without much ado, Your Excellencies, that I crave an indulgence to please permit me at this juncture to invite the Hamsman of the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies Former Minister of National Planning, Professor Abubakar Olariwaju Suleiman, DG Niels, to please approach the podium for your welcome remarks. Please allow like us to please give him a very big round of applause as he makes his way here.
Your Excellency, distinguished President of the Senate, Senator Hamad Lawal, PAD, UCN. Your Excellency, Right Honorable Speaker, House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Mila, CFR. Your Excellency, the Chairman of Education, Malam Nasser Erofai, CON, Executive Governor of Kaduna State, Principal Officers of the Senate, Principal Officers of the House of Representatives, Members of the Federal Executive Council here present. Your Royal Majesty, permit me to stand on the existing protocol. It is with great pleasure and humility that I welcome Your Excellency and distinguished dignitary to this important occasion. An occasion as this is undoubtedly rare for the fact that the head of governments of the federations and chief executive of state governments with two important dignitaries from National Assembly and other members of National Assembly are here in attendance. We are issued the borders on parliamentary initiative and processes are being brought to the front banner, while account of the parliamentary stride are being showcased. Today's occasion clearly attests to the robust nature of the executive legislative complementarity that is brought to bear on democratic practices in, Af in Africa, where Nigeria is taking the lead. For if the symbiotic relationship between these very important arms of government, such as being witnessed here today, is threatened, it portends a leeway for democracy and impactful good governance to thrive. This, however, does not preclude the two arms having to occasionally diverge, even seriously on issues that have direct bearing on the lives of their constituents. Your Excellencies, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are here today for the second in the series of parliamentarian public lectures, being organized by the National Assembly to serve as a platform where members of the parliament could tell their stories, program accomplishments, and challenges. Today's lecture, like the maiden one, is an avenue of legislative narration and a veritable platform connecting both the elected representative and the people beyond the confines of the two allo chambers. Why the maiden edition was delivered by no other person but the chairman of the Ninth National Assembly, distinguished Senator Hamad Lawa, PAD in the year 2021. Today's occasion, being the second edition, will be delivered by the right honorable speaker, Femi Akim Gajabia Mela who no doubt remain one of the most experienced parliamentarians in West African sub region. No doubt, no any other person can do the narration more than the speaker himself, telling us what have been the contract fulfillments of the ninth representative before today. It is to this end, therefore, that I enjoy Nigerians and indeed friends of Nigeria to keep faith with this project. There is a greater expectation that today's lecture will not only properly define concepts, articulate position, and agree on areas of accord while chatting ways to resolve areas of discord. It will further make legislative processes even clearer to Nigerians. Before I hand this address, therefore, may I urge the distinguished audience to please be free to ventilate your opinions, constructive criticism, and even concerns as they relate to legislative issues. Finally, let me respectively express our appreciation to the special guest of honor, the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Mohamed Buhari, GCFR, the Chairman of today's occasion, Malam Nasser Erufai, and indeed other eminent distinguished Nigerians for responding to this occasion. The support and guidance by the Senate President and the Right Honorable Speaker is greatly appreciated. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, against this backdrop, I, on behalf of the leadership of National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Study, invite you to listen attentively, appreciate the insight that will be shared with us, note your concerns, 
and engage the process. You are most welcome. Thank you very much. We can do better with that round of applause for the Director General, National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. Thank you so very much. Moving on, I'd like to, at this juncture, invite the man from amongst the very many governors of Nigeria that has been selected and also has agreed to chair these events, despite the exigencies of the times that we are in. Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to please join me in welcoming with a very resounding applause the distinguished chairman of his occasion, His Excellency Malam Nasil El Rafai, C O N, the Executive Governor of Kaduna State and Chairman of this very event. We can keep it, keep the club coming until he gets to the podium. Your Excellency, sir. Thank you. Your Excellency. Special guest of honor, President Muhammad Buhari, represented because we know our president is in Washington on official engagement. Uh, Excellency number three, I call him the president of the Senate, chairman of the National Assembly, and chairman of the board of National Institute of Legal and Legislative Studies, Senator Ahmed Lawan. Our guest speaker and my brother, Right Honorable Femi Bajadia Miller, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Your Royal Highness the Emir of Kefi, who is representing the Sultan of Sokoto, my Lord Justice representing the Chief Judge of the FCT, Honorable Ministers, members of the National Assembly, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Good morning and welcome to this very important occasion. Your Excellencies, forgive me if I do not recognize all of you in the protocols because just looking across, I saw the former Vice Chancellor of uh, University of Abuja, my neighbor, who in his time recommended me for an honorary doctorate and I think I should recognize him. I also see our brother, Professor Atahiru Jiga, the person that started true election reforms in Nigeria, and many other distinguished Nigerians that are here. I am greatly honored to be invited out of 36 state governors and many other former governors to chair this occasion. I don't know what qualifies me to be invited other than perhaps my friendship with both the Senate President and the Speaker of the House who we have been engaging since 1999 and 2003 respectively. These two gentlemen are perhaps the most experienced legislators in the Fourth Republic and I congratulate them for their resilience. So I thank you for inviting me. It is a great honor. It is not an honor to me, but to all my colleagues that are governors <clears throat> to be invited to chair this occasion. Uh, the National Assembly, and indeed the legislature, is a very key and often the decapitated branch of government. Because whenever there is a military coup, every other arm of government is left intact to continue, but the National Assembly and the State Assemblies are usually dissolved. So we have found over time, due to years of military rule, legislative tradition has not developed as much, of, as, much as executive and judicial tradition. And this is why this kind of lectures are very, very important to continue to build the institutional strength and capacity of the National Assembly uh, as well as the State Houses of Assembly. There is also a lot of confusion about the role of the legislature 
because many of the constituents think that once you're in the legislature, you should get them contracts. They think that everyone in government awards contracts. They do not understand that the role of the legislature is to make laws as well as a savage, as a check on the executive and legislative uh, and judicial excesses. So there is a need for us to have this kind of interactions from time to time to foster understanding of the role of the legislature as well as how to make the legislature better. I therefore commend the Ninth Assembly and the National Institute for this initiative. And for me personally, being here is also an opportunity to learn and remedy my personal defects because uh, the, the legislature is one branch of the government that I know I can never function in. Um, the hard work needed to convince people to support even your motion is something some of us have no patience for. You know, the executive is very straightforward, is very hierarchical, and once you are the governor, we award is almost law. In the legislature, everyone is equal. And there is no leadership or management more difficult than managing your equals. So I don't envy Mr. Speaker and the Senate President at all because their job is perhaps the hardest job in this country. Managing equals is very, very difficult. Managing subordinates is easy. You can hire and fire. But managing equals is perhaps the most difficult. And I know I'm quite incapable of it. So any opportunity I have to interact with the legislature, I take it. I know that many of our colleagues, governors, uh, retire to the Senate. I can assure you I will never retire to the legislature because I don't think I will function there. Uh, so I really, really have great respect for those that are in the legislature and manage to make it function. So it's really a great pleasure to be here. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the role and the relationship between the three branches of government should be governed by collaboration, coordination and interdependence. Because none can function effectively in the public interest without the understanding and support of the others. In Kaduna State, we have a novel way of ensuring this. We constituted an informal state leadership council consisting of four representatives of each arm of government. I represent the executive arm along with the deputy governor the Chief of Staff and Secretary to the Government. The, legislator, the legislature is represented by the Speaker, the Deputy Speaker, the Majority Leader, and the Clerk of the State House of Assembly, while the Judiciary is represented by the Chief Judge, the Grand Caddy of the Sharia Court of Appeal, and the President of the Customary of Appeal, with the Chief Registrar of the High Court uh, present. It's an informal meeting. We don't have minutes. We just share documents, brief each other on executive challenges, legislative challenges, and judicial challenges, and agree on key policy directions for the state. Before we introduce any policy or any bill on the executive side, we usually discuss the outlines in the leadership council, which meeting we try to hold monthly. We don't always succeed because of our schedules, but we do meet from time to time. I think this explains why in the last 90 months, the Kaduna State House of Assembly has been able to pass as many as 200 pieces of legislation because we usually agree in advance the outline, so by the time the bill comes, there is very little um, uh, disagreement. No surprises at all. We brief each other. The legislature knows what we are thinking. We know what the legislature is thinking. And they 
judiciary also knows what the other two arms of government is thinking. This is something that I will recommend to every state government because in the last 90 months in Kaduna State it has worked for us. The key role of the legislature is to check the excesses of the executive and the judiciary. And that is why the first chapter of the Constitution, after the fundamental principles and the other introductory parts, deals with the legislature. The legislature is actually the ultimately most powerful arm of government. It is supposed to check excesses of the executive as well as the judiciary. And that is why it is the legislature only that can remove the chief justice or the chief judge of a state. Indeed, in other federal jurisdictions, even the appointment of ordinary judges has to be confirmed by the legislature. And this is something that I recommend, actually, that we introduce as a constitutional amendment so that all senior judges, judges of superior court of record, should be subject to confirmation by the State House of Assembly or the National Assembly, as the case may be. I want to end by commending the Ninth Assembly that improving that collaboration, coordination, and cooperation in the public interest works better for Nigerians than confrontation for personal and promotion of egotistical interest. This Ninth Assembly has passed the most important and seminal legislations in this Fourth Republic. I will mention just about five. While I was DG of BPE, we began the draft of the Petroleum Industry Bill in 2002. It went through several governments until this Ninth Assembly finally enacted it, I believe, some 18 years later. Congratulations. Since 1990, we've been operating on one Companies and Allied Matters Act when the world has moved on and metamorphosed and corporate practices have changed. It is the Ninth Assembly that enacted a new Company and Allied Matters Act to replace the one that we've been using since 1990. Again, our congratulations. This National Assembly also repealed the banks and other financial institutions act passed again in 1990, I think, or 91, and replaced it with a modern legislation to regulate our banks and financial system as a whole. Again, congratulations. The deep offshore decree that was enacted by the Abdus Salami administration in 1998 had become a problem that favored the multinationals to the detriment of Nigeria's personal, uh, uh, corporate interest. I must commend this Ninth Assembly for having the courage against all odds of enacting a new deep, show, deep offshore act that protects the interest of our country. And again, we commend and congratulate you for that. Finally, uh, this, this Ninth Assembly enacted the most far-reaching health insurance legislation in Nigeria's history that will afford every Nigerian health insurance and achieve universal health coverage. And congratulations for that. And finally, it is this assembly under its watch that the tradition of introducing finance bills to amend tax legislation and provide the fiscal basis for the budget was reintroduced. This we have not done since 1996. This Ninth Assembly, I think, deserves the commendation and the support of all Nigerians for its performance. Um, this is quite apart from the brand new legislations like the student loan bill, the economic stimulus, and other wide-ranging constitutional alterations that this Assembly has past, which is the most, most encompassing in this Fourth Republic. 
awaiting the action of the State Houses of Assembly. But that is not all. Um, like Oliver Twist, I think this Assembly in the last six months can still do a bit more. And I'll list a few areas, seven areas indeed, that perhaps um, the National Assembly should look at as it rounds up its remarkable and very commendable uh, four years. Uh, first is state and community policing. I think we are all clear now that the current policing system is broken and doesn't work for Nigeria. And Nigeria is the only federation in the world with one centralized police system. I think this National Assembly has the capacity to enact a state and community policy system that prevents the abuses of the past and takes it into account the challenges of the present. Uh, secondly, value-added tax has become a major source of survival of this country because this year the NNPC has not brought a penny to the Federation account. We'll be relying on taxes particularly value-added tax. And the fact that the value-added tax is not on the exclusive list is a major source of concern for the fiscal health of the Federation. And I think that is something that this National Assembly can do something about in, the, in its last six months. Uh, there are issues about uh, rebalancing of the Federation uh, like onshore mining and petroleum assets to be placed on concurrent list, the federalization of the judiciary, because Nigeria, again, is the only federation with a unitary judiciary which does not work for everyone. And finally, for me, we've done this in Kaduna State, but it will be helpful if the National Assembly takes charge of this and makes it uh, a national uh, policy and legislation of making 12 years of education free primary secondary technical and vocational education to make the first 12 years not just basic education nine years free compulsory and to be a first line charge on this budget of states and local governments this country can never make progress without educating everyone uh, by 2050, Nigeria will be the third most populous country in the world. And we must educate everyone if that population is to be productive and advance the interests of the country. And, and finally, of course, reforming the local government system uh, to make the local governments more autonomous of the states, but yet to make each local government flexible to meet the needs of the state. Because in a diverse country like Nigeria, one local government system does not fit all. We have our histories, we have our traditions, what can work in Kaduna, where the native authority system used to work very well in northern Nigeria, cannot work in Anambra state uh, that has no such tradition. So it's something that requires some creative legislation, but I am quite confident that my two brothers here uh, the, dep the Senate President, I call him number three, and my brother, Speaker Baban Jamila, as we call him in Kaduna, are up to the task. So I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to address this August gathering and to be the chairman of this occasion. Um, I will take my seat and allow our guest lecturer to do what he does best. But let me ad uh, apologize in advance that I may not stay the whole period because today I am hosting the presidential candidate of our party, Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Jinubu, uh, in Kaduna. We have a Northwest Zona Rally flag off tomorrow, but he decided to come a day in advance because he likes Kaduna so much. So I have to leave. Uh, to receive him at the airport at some point. I would like, with the greatest respect, if my brother number three will take over as chairman when I leave. Uh, I hope 
that will be okay for everyone. I thank you for your invitation. And God bless you all. God bless the National Assembly. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The opening remarks of the distinguished chairman of this occasion, who has um, thrown open so very many issues surrounding the achievements recorded thus far by the presiding officers of the National Assembly of Nigeria, President of the Senate and Speaker of the House of Representatives, and posterity and history will be kind when the story of the Ninth Assembly is being written. And of course, he has also gone out ahead to also give kudos on the very uh, very many achievements that you've recorded. I'd like to please put our hands together one more time for the chairman of this occasion, Governor of Kaduna State. Thank you so very much, sir. Moving on, I just want to announce that we are live on the channel's television networks, and we'd like to also recognize the presence of distinguished Senator Bello Mandia, the chairman of the Senate Committee on Water Resources, as we also recognize Honorable Benjamin Kalu, Chairman of the House Committee on Media and Public Affairs. We welcome you. Let me also recognize the presence of the Honorable Minister of Women Affairs, former Deputy Governor of Plata State, Her Excellency Dame Pauline Talen, OFR. Please a round of applause for her. It is at this point that I consider it very expedient to then invite the number three citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Chairman of the National Assembly, President of the Senate, and Chairman Governing Council, National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies, His Excellency, Most Distinguished Senator Ahmed Ibrahim Lawan, PhD, GCON, Sabdaunam Badi. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the President of the Senate for his remarks at this occasion. Your Excellency, the President of the Senate, sir. Thank you. Your Excellency, our President, who is represented here, the Right Honorable Speaker, my brother, my friend, my co-traveler, very distinguished and honored members of the National Assembly present, our chairman of this event, my friend and brother, whom I call number one in Kaduna. Malan Nasru Erfai, the executive governor of Kaduna State. Your Excellency, the governor, my friend, said you can never be a legislator or a parliamentarian because you don't have the patience. I think you have the patience. You have already started campaigning for some bills, for some legislations to be passed. So it means you can lobby well. And let me also remark on something that you said, that it is easy to lead in the executive arm of government because you hire on fire. And in the parliament, you lead equals. Actually, our colleagues are not our equals. They are our bosses. They hire us and they can fire us. So it's a complete reversal of role. But our colleagues in the Fourth Assembly, in the Fourth Republic, Eighth Assembly, Ninth Assembly have been very, very magnanimous, having given us all the support, all the way. And everything you have mentioned here as an achievement should be credited to the distinguished senators and honor members of the Ninth National Assembly. Because without them, nothing, nothing would have been achieved. 
So I take this opportunity to thank all our distinguished and honorable colleagues. The clerk to the National Assembly, the director Nails, the man who has been very, very innovative and creative. I've seen some of our uh, resource persons in other areas, the former chairman of INEC, Professor Jega, the former vice chancellor of the University of Abuja, our royal majesties, the sultan is represented, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, good morning. The protocol does not include our resource process of today because I only mentioned the Honorable Speaker. I did that deliberately because Mr. Speaker today will be speaking not as a speaker. He'll be speaking to us as our resource person for today. Last year I did that job. This year is my brother's time. I'm talking about the speaker. I want to assure this gathering and those who may be listening elsewhere, that you know your belts be ready for a very smooth and productive journey. The topic itself is something that should excite all of us, both the Senate and the House, at the beginning of this ninth National Assembly came up with what you call our legislative agendas. Very similar, more or less, but of course that is what it should be, because we think alike, we believe that Nigeria first. We believe that the national interest must always take precedence on what we do in this ninth National Assembly. No matter what, at the end of the day, we want to write our names, we will not wait for anybody to write it for us, in gold or platinum, because we should be very happy with ourselves at the end of the day that we have come to the ninth National Assembly and we have done our jobs very patriotically and to the extent that those who may be doubtful may also agree. I'm happy that we have already been recognized as an assembly that has tried to do a lot of work. We broke so many jinxes. We recorded so many firsts because of the commitment of this ninth National Assembly. So, Honorable Speaker, there is no better person to speak about what the ninth House of Representatives agenda, legislative agenda is, naturally will be successful in other areas, but will be challenged in others. And this is an opportunity for the Nigerian citizens to know what we do in the ninth National Assembly. In fact, we have to tell the world our story. Because this arm of government, like the chairman of this event said, is always at the receiving end when democracy suffers from incursions by the military in the past. So it's like always starting again and again. But thank God, 23 years and counting, this time around, we have raised 20, more than 20 years, and I think the legislature is developing very rapidly and very fast. So what we have been able to achieve in the ninth National Assembly, especially in the House of Representatives, will be presented here today. And this is an opportunity for also our citizens to ask questions. Because what we need to do is to enlighten Nigerians on what we do, what our challenges are, because this is what you pay us to do and we must account for what we do to you. The Distinguished Parliamentarians Lecture Series is one of the laudable initiatives of NILS 
geared towards bridging the gap between the electorates and their elected representatives. It is also an avenue for we in the parliament to tell our stories to the wider audience so as to change the misperception and misinformation in the public domain. I know we'll try our best, but let there be no doubt the parliament will remain misunderstood for some time. Not only in Nigeria, but all over the world, even the American democracy, the British democracy. People, citizens still feel parliamentarians are simply lazy people. Until you get close to know what parliamentarians do, you will think we go there and say, yes, no, no. Those yes make laws for us. The nays. Sometimes we'll have it save the country from bad or maybe not well grounded an, an effort to legislate on something. So it is very, very important that we understand that one, no matter what we do, we will still be seen as, well, people elected to do nothing but drink tea and maybe have jumbo pace. And in so many events, I dared people, I said, if there is anyone who knows where we have Jumbo Pace in the National Assembly, such a person should go and show us. Because we know that that parliament, that National Assembly, is at this moment, at this moment, underfunded. So we we'll continue with this kind of practice. The parliamentary series, being the second, I'm sure will be continued in the next assembly, in the next 10th assembly, because it affords students the opportunity to participate, whether directly as those of you who are here, or indirectly those that may be listening to us from nowhere, from somewhere. No doubt the legislature, which is the fulcrum of democracy worldwide, has been misunderstood. Some for mischievous purposes and reasons, and at times as owing to its underdeveloped stature historically. It is in lieu of this that the first parliamentarian's lecture, which I delivered last year, gave a lucid narration of such misplaced perception of Ninth Assembly under our leadership. Today's second series of the Distinguished Parliamentarian's Lecture attempt a critical assessment of the House of Representatives within the context of its legislative agenda. This is because the importance of the House of representatives in the annals of Nigeria's political and legal evolution cannot be overemphasized. We all know that the House is normally the radical arm of the National Assembly. It's the same here, it's the same in the U.S., and it's everywhere. Thank God I served in the House for eight years, between 1999 and 2007, and I know the transformation and changes I've gone through. When I was in the House, of course, I was thinking differently from what I do today. And that is because the House has its own orientation, its own sensibilities, its own sentiments. And we like that because that brings some even, some balance, that at least when you have legislations, the hot and the cold could produce something that is warm enough to ensure that it provides the medicine, the efficacy that is required. Tellingly, the Ninth National Assembly, including the Ninth House of Representatives, has passed some of the most groundbreaking and significant legislations in the history of parliamentarism in Sub-Saharan Africa. To mention but a few, the Companies and Allied Matters Act, which was passed in 2020, has revolutionized Nigeria's corporate world and fostered the ease of doing business in courts, agenda of the federal government of Nigeria. The, Parliament, the Petroleum Industry Act, which was passed in 2021, is a watershed enactment that clearly stipulates new principles, new regulatory regimes, and new governance frameworks for the realization of the full promise of Nigeria's hydrocarbons potential. These groundbreaking legislations, among many others passed by this National Assembly, with the significant contributions of ninth House of Representatives demonstrate the fulfillment of this National Assembly 
of its obligations under the social contract that exists between us and Nigerians. Permit me to conclude by appreciating Nigerians for keeping faith with the government and especially with the National Assembly as the Ninth Assembly would stop at nothing to ensure that these things get better for the teeming population that we have. And of course we have to be in a hurry, we have to be in a haste because the population of this country will double in 2030 and we have to be prepared to not only cater for people of today but think of what happens to us tomorrow. So legislations, very good legislations that will ensure economic stability, that will ensure security, that will ensure creation of jobs for our team in youth are very, very significant and important. I equally wish to assure the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies of our commitment to ensure that this laudable initiative is sustained. We hope that the subsequent distinguished parliamentarians lecture series would incorporate parliamentarians across West Africa and indeed the continents elsewhere. It is therefore on this note that I wish to specially extend my gratitude to the special guest of honor, the chairman of the occasion and other important dignitaries, especially from the executive for accepting to be here, because such cooperation and harmony are key for good governance and democratic dividends for our people. And talking about the chairman, I think we'll task you to lobby for us. We have sent the outcome of our constitutional review, and we are yet to receive all from the states. So we should be able to wind up this process by getting responses from the State House of Assembly. And some of these issues that you have raised that require our attention, of course they will be given the attention. But I think it is important that we deal with what we have already sent out to the State House of Assembly and then we take the next steps. And even if it is one month that we have left, we have the, 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 the capacity working together to ensure that we pass some of the legislation that are required in a very expeditious manner. So help us lobby, because I can see you do that very, very well. Lobby your colleague governors. I once again welcome and wish you all fruitful lecture to be delivered by right honorable speaker of the House of Representatives, someone I met in 2003 in the House of Representatives, right honorable Femi Bajabi Amila, CFR, as you listen attentively. With this, I declare this year's Distinguished Parliamentarian Lecture Series wide open to the glory of Almighty Allah. Thank you. God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Thank you. Can we get a big round of applause for the number three citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. The distinguished chairman of this occasion, Your Excellency, the Governor of Kaduna State, Malam Ahmed Arifai, CON, the President of the Senate, our Speaker, House of Representatives, please permit me to stand by the already established protocol. Just before we invite the guest lecturer to come and deliver his lecture, it is important to note that the Ninth National Assembly has been described in very many quarters as the most proactive, vibrant, and virile since Nigeria's return to democracy. The spot documentary you're about to watch sheds light on the giant strides of these unsung heroes of our democracy, and it is tagged Ninth Assembly of Patriots. This will serve as our intro to bringing 
the number four citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to then deliver his lectures. Please, let's watch. Democracy, the legislature, it is. From the dawn of her redefined self government in 1999, the giant of Africa has experienced different assemblies of legislators, from the point of proclamation by the president to the moment of adjournment, Sindai. The 11th day of June 2019 marked the pronouncement of the 9th National Assembly with its tasks clearly cut out from inception as succeeding generations await the reports of its stewardship. It was a case of experience meets preparation as the mantle of leadership was placed on Ahmad Ibrahim Lawan and Femi Akim Bajabiamila as the president of the Senate and Speaker of the House of Representatives, respectively. With shoulders prepared to bear the burden of leading and hearts of service, they arrived at a delicate time, when the nation was neck deep in challenges of economic downturn, insecurity, and many anomalies that needed urgent legislative attention. In the Ninth Assembly, Ninth Senate particularly has been that it should be a Senate that works for Nigerians. That is whatever we we'll do, we should be guided by the national interest. Our responsibility as legislators is to, to make laws for good governments, to oversight, to attract federal presence. And I think every member of the House, irrespective of what people say, every member of the House has done his best and is doing his best to meet those obligations. With sweat and toil, these heroes of democracy mapped out a legislative agenda which outlined a framework of ideas and actions that would help find some of the answers we all seek. The Ninth National Assembly worked tirelessly on striking out the oddities. Then COVID-19 struck barely eight months into its inauguration. While the pandemic created a global scourge, leadership made all the difference. The Ninth Assembly, like a captain steering through turbulent tides, provided the compass that was able to steady the national ship through the adoption of innovative and proactive legislative means, as well as palliative measures to allay the impact of the pandemic on Nigerians. Also, to curtail the economic repercussions of the pandemic, the House of Representatives passed the Emergency Economic Stimulus Bill in 2020. We came up with, um, with bills which, even before they made it all the way to becoming law, the executive uh, adopted a lot of the provisions in that bill. When you compare uh, what happened during that period, to other even more advanced democracies, you know that Nigeria did very well. The assembly has been described in different quarters as the most proactive since Nigeria's return to democracy. Both the red and green chambers fixated on legislation that impacts everyday Nigerians, the security structure of the nation, the economy, as well as the electoral and democratic institutions. Worthy of note is the intervention initiated by this assembly of undaunted men and women to help tackle insecurity in the country where seven bills with overlapping mandates on security, intelligence and related agencies were reviewed as a two-day national legislative reform retreat. The achievements were aided by ethical politicking, healthy brinksmanship, and consensus strategy. Some groundbreaking strides of the Ninth Assembly include the intervention of the Speaker House of Representatives, which necessitated the suspension of the eight months long strike action by the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU. Perhaps. 
Another feat of the 9th Assembly is the Electoral Act Amendment of 2022, which aims at strengthening the electoral process and reinforcing the commitment of governments to instilling public confidence in the electoral process and institutions of the nation. The legislation, intervention, innovation and foresight of the Ninth Assembly are an enormous investment in the citizenry and intricate contribution to the tapestry of socio-economic development in Nigeria. The accomplishments of the Ninth Assembly could only be a figment of imagination without the direction and orchestration of distinguished Senator Ahmad Ibrahim Lawan, PhD, GCON, and Right Honorable Femi Akim Bajabi Amila, CFR, who bethed his ship at the shore of glory. These courageous and visionary gentlemen provided exemplary leadership to this assembly of patriots that succeeded where others failed, stood strong where others fell, and marched forward where others stopped. The magnificence of the Ninth Assembly is certainly crafted on the pages of history as posterity will learn from the exploits of its own song heroes who have Nigeria encrypted in their DNA. Distinguished parliamentarians, when the day is done and you are called upon to give accounts, the custodian of the books shall surely say, you may please take a bow. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with that video clip, I beg to stand by the existing protocol as I invite the guest lecturer for the 2022 Annual Parliamentarians Lecture Series of the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. I therefore please join you and ask you to please join me in welcoming to the podium the number four citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency, the Right Honorable Femi Bajabia Mila, CFR, Speaker, House of Representatives, and Alternate Chairman, National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. Can we make that applause for him a lot louder, please? Your Excellency, the Speaker. Thank you very much. The Senate President, His Excellency Senator Ahmed Lawan, my colleague, my friend, my co-driver in this journey, as he rightly put it. Thank you for being you. Well, let me very quickly say that I'd rather the appellation of the House of Representatives as a vibrant house as opposed to a radical house. The governor, or rather, very quickly, my distinguished senators and uh, members of the House of Representatives here present, our chairman, the governor of Kaduna State, who has always been very supportive and been a friend over the years. Thank you once again for honoring this invitation at a very short notice. I believe you were only aware of this just a few days ago. Thank you for taking time out and coming in from Kaduna to honor us with your presence. You have said a lot about the model that works in Kaduna State and how you've built harmony between the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. And I commend your model to other state assemblies to try and emulate so that uh, their states, their various states can forge ahead. But in doing that, they should also be very mindful of 
not putting to jeopardy the very essential ingredient of democracy, which is checks and balances. Because when you, when you describe how you guys sit down in a room without, informally, without notes, without uh, minutes, there's a tendency that you guys get too chummy and become friends. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as it is understood that in that friendship, everybody has a role to play, particularly in our constitutional democracy that talks about checks and balances. I commend that model. Thank you so much. The CNA, the Royal Highness, the Emir of Kefi, who is uh, representing the Sultan here, you're very welcome. The DG Nils, former chairman, and Honorable Minister of Women Affairs, that you came in. Um, I recognize you just as I, just as I was coming to the, to the podium. You're very welcome. All distinguished uh, guests that are present here, please forgive me and allow me to stand on the established protocol. The legislature, perhaps, I would say is the most misunderstood institution or arm of government in Nigeria. Sometimes many of these things are undeserved, and sometimes I'll be the first to admit they're self-inflicted. But it is important that when we have moments like this, to put things in perspective and in context and to educate many of us who do not actually understand the rudiments and uh, what it takes to be in the legislature and to put records straight. And that's why I was delighted and looked forward to this such auspicious moment to try and put things in proper perspective. I am delighted, like I said, to be here today and I'm honored to deliver this lecture on the second edition of the Distinguished Parliamentarian Series organized by the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. One of the peculiarities of our democracy in Nigeria is that much of our population does not understand the legislature's role in our democratic arrangement. At best, there is a recognition that parliament has a responsibility to make laws for the good governance of the nation. However, the realities of resource availability and the imperatives of policy and politics culture and tradition that impose limitations on parliaments are not recognized and understood by most. The Distinguished Parliamentarians Lecture Series is a worthy innovation. It is an opportunity to provide information and context to help our fellow Nigerians better understand the democracy we practice. Ultimately, it will help ensure political accountability based on a collective understanding of the roles and responsibilities of all of us, citizens and those in government and outside of government. Let me take a moment to talk about the legislative agenda of the Ninth House of Representatives. Now, when we resumed in the Ninth House of Representatives, and my, gracious, my colleagues graciously elected me to lead them, I made a commitment that the Ninth House would be a reform assembly. I envisioned a center of policy innovation and an agent of transformation in the administration of the affairs of the Nigerian state. My colleagues and I recognized that keeping that promise required a structured approach to legislative policy making. That structured process by necessity had to begin with articulating our policy goals, development ambitions, and the priorities to which we would devote scarce resources. 
This is how we came to the idea of a legislative agenda designed for the House of Representatives with input from stakeholders. Subsequently, I appointed a special committee led by Professor Julius Inonvere, a distinguished parliamentarian and vastly experienced policy expert, to lead the process of developing the legislative agenda of the Ninth House. The committee began its assignment by engaging first with members of the House and then with people from all walks of life. They identified and articulated a set of priorities that, if addressed responsibly, will change the face of our nation and improve the lives of millions of people. From this effort emerged an ambitious agenda that cut across 15 policy areas, beginning with the reform of the House of Representatives. We propose reforms to how the House of Representatives manages its affairs, from financial administration to committee operations and the process of vote taking and recording. We recognize that to advance reform proposals across, across government, we needed first to make sure that the House itself was in good shape to deliver on our goals. But just as importantly, we needed to make sure our own house was in the best order so we could have the credibility to drive change and call others to task when the need arose. Other areas of intervention in the legislative agenda included national budget reform, national security, economic growth and job creation, education reform, gender equity and public health, among several others. When the committee concluded its assignment, the draft legislative agenda was presented to the House of Representatives for consideration, debate, and adoption. This was necessary to ensure ownership of the legislative agenda by all members of the House of Representatives, regardless of partisan affiliation or other such consideration. And that's where we adopted or put into practice the theme which we now operate, uh, we've operated for years, in the House, that nation building was a joint task. We, rep we presented the legislative agenda to the Nigerian people in October of 2019 as a public record of our commitment to allow fellow citizens to assess the House's performance by our fidelity to those commitments. We were immediately successful in implementing the legislative agenda when we passed and Mr. President signed the 2020 appropriation bill into law by December 2019. This allowed us to begin and maintain thus far the tradition of a January to December national budget cycle. Now, three years after, the dysfunction of the process that existed, existed before has been largely forgotten. This is what progress does. It allows us to leave the past behind us as we march forward to a better tomorrow. However, it is essential to remember from whence we came. This way, we can appreciate the road traveled and be reminded of what we can achieve when we work together with purpose and dedication. We resumed in the new year, motivated and energized to continue with the implementation efforts. Our priorities included the Petroleum Industry Bill, reforms of the Electoral Act, the Deep Offshore and Inland Basin Production Sharing Contracts, the Companies and Allied Matters Act, the Police Act, and several other vital legislations. We also began efforts to reform the statutory framework of public health emergency response and management in Nigeria, improve the policy and legislative process, and the general administration of the House of Representatives alongside robust efforts to ensure full compliance with the Appropriations Act by ministries, departments, and agencies of the government. Unbeknownst to us, our world was about to change profoundly in ways we did not anticipate and we're wholly prepared for. I am speaking about the COVID-19 pandemic that swept the world with the fury of a thousand storms, leaving devastation from which we are yet to recover. 
by March 2020, Abuja, Lagos, Ogu states, and many others had been locked down to prevent the spreading of the deadly virus. In April, lockdowns extended across the country. Almost all governing efforts focused on ensuring welfare of the Nigerian people through those unprecedented times. However, the measures we initiated to improve how we operated in the House of Representatives proved patient and allowed Parliament to play an important role in the pandemic response. Just before the lockdowns, the House of Representatives, in an unprecedented effort, proposed and passed in one day the Emergency Economic Stimulus Bill to provide for relief on corporate tax liability, suspend import duties on selected goods, and defer residential mortgage obligations to the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria for a fixed term to protect jobs and alleviate the financial burden on citizens in response to the economic downturn occasioned by the outbreak of COVID-19 disease. That bill never became law. However, the policy proposals contained therein were implemented mainly through executive action by the President, His Excellency Mohammed Buhari GCFR, and subsequent legislation thereafter. Despite the lockdowns that prevented the House from sitting in plenary, we intervened to ensure the welfare of doctors and medical professions at the fore of the public health response. We supported the provision of hazard pay and maintained lines of communication and collaboration with the National Association of Resident Doctors. Members of the House contributed their salaries to the pandemic response and ensured that interventions by the federal government got to the people most in need. As quickly as possible, we returned to plenary albeit under restricted conditions, and set to the task of considering improvements to the statutory framework of public health emergency response and management in the country. All of these were possible because of efforts to change how the House operates, including improving civil service and political personnel capacity. It is clear to us that the quality of our response could have been much better if some of the proposed reforms had already been implemented at the time. For example, we proposed in the legislative agenda to strengthen the use of information and communications technology in the conduct of our activities, that is the legislative activities. We especially intended to put technology systems of interaction between the legislature and citizens to improve citizen participation in the legislative process. This would have been a beneficial tool to monitor the implementation of the government's intervention policies and prevent some of the lapses later discovered in the distribution of food aid, medical supplies, and financial support across the country. Also for the period when the parliament could not sit due to the lockdown restrictions, Coordination between legislators and legislative personnel to allow for the continuation of critical oversight efforts would have been greatly enhanced with the right technology tools. We took these lessons on board and have continued to prepare better for the future. Now I want to segue a little bit and talk about the updated legislative agenda our prioritized legislative interventions and the implementation framework. The COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the politics and economy of Nigeria and the world. Its consequences have unsettled international relations and caused us to re-examine our assumptions about the world and our place in it. Our national challenges remain the same, but the pandemic put things in sharper focus and concentrated our minds on the dire and imminent consequences of a failure to act quickly across multiple sectors. At the same time, the contraction in the global economy triggered by the pandemic meant that there were new questions about resource availability and allocation. It was immediately clear to us in the House of Representatives 
that the fundamentals upon which we had based our legislative agenda had shifted so dramatically as to necessitate a review of that document. I therefore reconsidered and expanded and expanded the special committee on the legislative agenda to lead this review. And they did. With the support of the Department of International Development in Nigeria and the partnership to engage, reform and learn. That is, as we know, as we call them, Pearl. The updated legislative agenda of the Ninth House of Representatives is a streamlined version of the earlier document. Whereas its predecessor, that is the first document, was broadly ambitious, the new document, the updated one, went for depth. We went from 15 priority areas to 10. Now, this did not mean the other areas where we had previously proposed interventions had suddenly become less important. No, far from it. In the updated legislative agenda, we adopted a consolidation approach to address the same challenges, recognizing the more significant constraints imposed by the new realities. Let me explain the consolidation approach. Government is ultimately a series of interconnected and overlapping priorities. Improvements in one area, or failures for that matter, will often have a cascading effect in other areas. The new strategy we adopted required us to emphasize the interconnectedness of policy actions and consequences. For example, if you fix the power supply in Nigeria, the cascading effects will spread through the national economy with impact on job creation and employment, national security, agriculture, and food security at the very least. In the same way, interventions such as the school feeding program ultimately help reduce the number of out-of-school children while simultaneously improving health care and social welfare outcomes. It's a no-brainer. So in addition to the new approach, the updated legislative agenda also included an implementation framework that outlined specific actions, the individuals responsible for those actions, and the timeline for implementation. We called this updated legislative agenda our contract with Nigerians to reflect the revised content, the latest strategy, and the new implementation approach. But most importantly, we called this document a contract because that is exactly what it is. A written account of what we owe the people and how we intend to meet our obligations within the shortest possible time. In July of 2020, we again presented our legislative agenda to the Nigerian people. At the public presentation, I called on my colleagues to remember that although the legislative agenda had changed, our mission remained the same. That is to protect those who, we need, us, who, who need us, to shield them, to empower through opportunity, to decide what future we want, and then to build it. With the new updated legislative agenda and the implementation framework in place, we also considered and decided on a different approach to implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. With the original document, we had largely left implementation to the standing committees of the House of Representatives, recognizing their preeminence as the primary mechanisms of legislative action. But this time around, with the updated document, whilst the committees still held their standing and played their roles, a special committee on monitoring and implementation of the legislative agenda was created to coordinate efforts across the multiple committees. This was an effort to give full effect to the consolidation approach adopted in the updated legislative agenda and prevent this sort of policy isolation that happens when policy making happens in silos. Alongside the special committee on monitoring and implementation of the legislative agenda, I appointed a policy innovation and monitoring unit in the office of the speaker to coordinate policy within the office as a delivery unit 
focused on legislative process management and driving collaborations with outside stakeholder groups. Now, what are the achievements of the legislative agenda? Because it's one thing to have a document stating out precisely what you want to do. But it's another thing to be able to achieve in whatever measure what you have stated in your document so that it's ex worth more than the paper it's written on. The ninth House of Representatives has been an unusually productive parliament despite the limitations imposed by a global pandemic. We have taken legislation action or legislative action to address long-standing challenges of governance and economics in our country. We have passed landmark legislation to fix our oil and gas industry, reform the police, and reorganize the corporate administration system in our country. We have considered and passed meaningful legislation impacting all areas of our national life. Some of these bills are the Police Service Commission Act, the repeal and reenactment, the Electric Power Sector Reform Act Amendment Bill, the Deep Offshore and Inland Basic uh, Basin Production Sharing Contracts Act Amendment Bill, amongst others. We passed a slate of bills to reform the aviation sector and clean up our airports so that these critical national assets can be properly administered to the best expectations of the Nigerian people. We have reformed the annual budget process of the federal government. We have used the approach, uh, appropriations process and the power of parliament over the public purse to pursue community and constituency development across the country. We have invested in primary, secondary, and tertiary education infrastructure. We have provided ICT training centers to facilitate learning and enhance educational outcomes. There is virtually, virtually no constituency in the country that hasn't benefited from the significant investment to improve primary health, rehabilitate classrooms and schools, and provide community roads. We intervened to help resolve outstanding issues between the academic staff union of universities and the federal government so our young people could return to their academic pursuits after an extended period of industrial action by the union. Since then, the House of Representatives has worked to address the issues that led to the strike. We are currently working on the 2023 Appropriations Bill which includes a sum of 170 billion to provide a level of increment in the welfare package of university lecturers. The bill also includes an additional 300 billion in revitalization funds to improve the infrastructure and operations of federal universities. Furthermore, the House of Representatives has convened the Accountant General of the Federation the academic staff union of universities and other stakeholders to begin to facilitate the adoption of the elements of the university transparency and uh, accountability solution, otherwise known as UTAS, into the integrated payroll and personal, personnel information system, IPPIS. This effort is being supervised by the Chairman of the House Committee on Tertiary Education, Rep Representative Aminu Suleiman. Now, these issues are the fundamentals that have been at the heart of the perennial agitation by the Union. To my recollection, ASU brought to the table four critical demands, revitalization, increased salary and welfare, adoption of uh, mutas, and payment of their salary while they were on strike for eight months. What the House did was to address all those issues. And we did successfully four items, or four critical items. 
the fourth was outside the purview of the house we promised that we will talk to government and try and see how their demands will be accommodated for increase for for payment of their eight month salary not based on the law but that we would appeal to the president just for the sake of appealing for want of a better way to put it and we did unfortunately that matter has not been resolved so i believe that if you bring four demands to the table and three of those are addressed i think both parties have done well now having addressed those we are now motivated to focus on addressing the issues of funding educational standard and student and staff welfare that are necessary to build 21st century tertiary institutions worthy of their name this is the reason why just a few weeks ago we convened a national summit on tertiary education reform that brought stakeholders including past presidents together for two days to conduct a holistic review of the tertiary education sector in the country and make recommendations for necessary action to improve the sector now these and other interventions in the education sector are a critical component of our legislative agenda and our commitment to strengthening human capital development by providing access to quality education opportunities across the country education is one of the most impactful areas of public policy in any society when you get the education policy right it is the gift that keeps giving through generations a university degree or a tertiary qualification of some other kind can be the spark that changes the trajectory of an entire family evidence abounds of the transformations that can happen when ambition and diligence are amplified by, by access to quality education and training for this reason education is central to the consolidation approach adopted in the updated legislative agenda by outlining some of the many achievements of the ninth house of representatives it is not my intention to take a victory lap of any kind our system of policing and the judiciary our infrastructure and public service and so many areas of our national life still fall far short of our best aspirations we have made improvements to our electoral laws to enable far-reaching reforms to improve the process through which we elect political leaders yet we still need to improve the internal process of nominations within the political parties the amendment of the police act 2020 put in place a new system for reporting investigating and sanctioning abuse of police power yet such incidents persist across the country though much has been done much yet remains to do to deliver our people from the degradations of poverty and lack protect them from the machinations of criminals and terrorists and reform our politics and government to better reflect the best of who we are and be more responsible or responsive to the obligation to be a catalyst of national development however the last four years have been a period of consequential interventions and essential reforms that lay the foundation for future growth and prosperity we must acknowledge this and draw lessons to guide us going into the future what are the challenges that we have faced in implementation of our legislative agenda for us in the house of representatives the legislative agenda the implementation framework and the model for monitoring and implementation we instituted in the ninth house of representatives is evidently a significant improvement on what came before it sets a new template that will continue to be revised and improved by succeeding parliaments to the ultimate benefit of the Nigerian people. 
Ensuring this happens is particularly important because the most significant benefits of this new approach will only be achieved through sustained action. The way to make this happen, in my opinion, is by critically appraising the successes, failures, and challenges thus far and adopting changes when necessary to ensure improved outcomes. The biggest challenge of implementation we have encountered with the legislative agenda is one that often imperils reform of efforts worldwide. And what is that? The refusal to embrace change. Both consciously and otherwise, there usually is institutional resistance to fundamental changes in policy and processes in the public sector. This is compounded by the numbers of constituencies whose interests, concerns, and expectations must be factored in and managed. We have 360 members in the House of Representatives from nearly a dozen political parties. We have the National Assembly Service Commission as a parliamentary civil service with thousands of personnel a multitude of political and, poli and policy aides, and so many other interested parties, many of whom may be used to doing things differently. Time and careful management are indispensable components of successful reform in arenas like this. Then, of course, you have the issue of competing objectives. How do you set a legislative agenda that adequately captures the priorities of constituents in Surulere, in Inewi, in Daura, Gubio, Ogoja, and Wase at the same time? At the same time, diverse constituencies. How do you assure the members representing these diverse constituencies that the priorities of their constituents won't get lost in a streamlined, collaborative, and coordinated approach to legislative policy making? How do you bring the Senate, another independent arm, and the executive along when you have managed to ensure that the House is committed to the same priorities and rowing in one accord to the same destination? These institutions that I've mentioned, and many more, have their preferences as they should, and they are just as obliged to pursue those objectives as they see fit. Yet the reality remains that our system of democratic checks and balances imposes limitations on each institution's ability to exercise power and authority in service of its objectives and priorities. Recently, the Central Bank of Nigeria announced a policy to redesign the Nigerian Naira and impose restrictions on the cash transactions across the economy. The National Assembly has been inundated with petitions from citizens worried about the impact of the new policies on their businesses and concerned that the policy approach will not deliver its stated policy objectives. Many have pointed to the fact that in India, where a similar policy was implemented beginning, I believe, in 2016. The expected benefits haven't materialized, yet there has been a pronounced contraction in the economy, probably linked to that policy. Now, whatever the concerns about the policy may be, it should, and I repeat, it should not be the normal course of things for such a profoundly impactful policy program to be designed, approved, and announced without any engagement with the legislature or any attempt to seek the perspectives of the people's representatives. Keep in mind, these are the very same people who will have to explain and answer for those policies 
in communities across the country. Whilst each arm of government has its prerogatives and guards them jealously, our country cannot afford actions that set the stage for the competing objectives of different arms of government to descend into governance dysfunction and paralyzing conflict. The success or failure of every significant governance initiative depends on the extent to which the objective is a shared priority of the different arms of government and in some cases of the state government. Consider, for example, the vexing issue of constitutional reforms. Several of the commitments in the legislative agenda require amendments to the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to achieve them. If you took a poll in this room now about the importance and need for substantive reforms to our nation's constitution, I am sure the poll would return an overwhelming majority in favor. The National Assembly passed a raft of amendments to the Constitution and advanced them to the states as required. That process now seems to have stalled in the state assemblies. As it is today, it is doubtful that the current constitutional amendment effort will conclude before the expression of the legislative arm, uh, the legislative term. I pray it does. We want it to, because the amendments are far-reaching. But the National Assembly right now is functional sufficient. So they, 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 we're done. We've moved the ball to the state assemblies. And I'm glad that the Senate President did appeal to Governor El Rufai to talk to his colleagues for us to quickly advance our course of democracy and return these far-reaching am amendments which we painstakingly as a House and as a Senate put together for the good governance of Nigeria. Despite broad national agreement on the need for reform, the potential for achievement can rise or fall based on differences in the expectations of the context, pace, and direction of the specific proposals. Two other challenging areas are that the legislative agenda of the House is a policy document. A statement of intent and an articulation of shared priorities. It is not a rule book. There are no mechanisms in it or elsewhere to compel legislative action, even within the House of Representatives. This is why we need to develop a system to drive its implementation through policy innovation and monitoring unit, which I said earlier that I set up in the office of the speaker. And through the special committee on monitoring and implementation of the legislative agenda. The infrastructure in place to drive implementation has been helpful. It is also limited by the fact that both the unit and the committee are new creations still develop the institutional capacity, expertise, and memory required to achieve more. Second, and related to the first, is the issue of resource availability. Effective policy making requires resources for research and data analysis, policy review, and policy assessment. You need to be able to convene people, sample expert opinions from across the, broad, or across the board, and subject policy proposals to broad scrutiny. Now, all of these require resources that are too often unavailable. It's not easy to build consensus around allocating scarce resources to process and planning activities, the benefits of which are not immediately quantifiable. Nonetheless, despite inadequate resources and a myriad of competing priorities, 
we must find a way to improve the resource allocation to these functions as the quality of our governance and our governance efforts depends in no small measure on the process of decision making that leads to government actions let me move quickly to the steps or what i believe should be next steps and the way forward now i have already spoken about the need to ensure that the house of representatives in its future iterations continues the agenda setting prioritization monitoring and evaluation model of legislative policy making embodied in the legislative agenda of the ninth house this cannot be overemphasized government is a continuum it is most effective when we learn from experience adapt lessons from history and build on past successes the committee on monitoring and implementation of the legislative agenda should become in the new parliament a standing committee of the house of representatives fully funded to serve as the in-house think tank policy coordinator and delivery unit of the house of representatives we need to adopt a new system of vetting legislative proposals for quality control and compliance with legislative agenda priorities amendments to the orders of the house will definitely be required for us to do this the design of future legislative agenda needs to be more collaborative to aid implementation efforts must be made ab initio to harmonize competing priorities of the various interests and stakeholder groups and align the different arms of government towards the same goals whatever the political settlement that emerges after the 2023 general elections which has suddenly come upon us all concerned must recognize that the government cannot afford to be at cross purposes with itself this doesn't mean that we must all agree on what needs to be done or that we must agree on the process of getting things done but we must take concerted efforts to identify areas of agreement and work on those together while seeking accommodations in other areas that allow us to advance little by little the consolidation strategy of policy development and implementation can be a helpful tool by directing attention towards the areas of overlap where competing interests may align one effective tool we have used in the house in the ninth house of representatives is a public policy dialogues which was initiated by this house these dialogues are highly structured engagements between stakeholders designed to build a shared understanding of issues and advance policy recommendations that address those issues in a manner the parties can agree on or that they can live with these dialogues have helped us to advance national security legislations that might otherwise have proved difficult to scale it is a model of stakeholder management that should be fully embraced in parliament and across government we have also significantly benefited from the value of collaborations with civil society organizations the private sector academia and international development partners these collaborations should become a matter of course with a structured system and procedures to enable these partnerships and ensure they happen within limits to prevent abuse ladies and gentlemen i began my lecture this morning by discussing the public's misconceptions about the legislature's role in our democracy this is a hugely significant problem even 
it is even more disturbing when you realize that these misunderstandings and misconceptions are not segregated by class or education. They are widely held even by those who you will expect to know better. As a result, there is a dangerous disconnect between the actual role of the legislature and the expectations by which the individual legislature is assessed and are judged by the media, constituents, and friends. The collapse of the system of local government administration in the country has created a situation where legislators are expected to fill in the gap, providing municipal, municipal public service The legislature is primarily a policy-making institution. The legislator's job is to work within that process to advance ideas, recommendations, and proposals that define the structure of the state and society, set spending priorities, and oversee government expenditure to ensure compliance with appropriation laws. The legislator is a representative and an advocate elected to make laws and design public policy for the good governance of the country. This should be the primary basis for assessing a legislator's capacity, competence, or quality of service, if you may. By every means necessary, we must endeavor to educate our citizens to understand this so that they can make the right electoral decisions to ensure the men and women they send to parliament are the right fit. Ladies and gentlemen, the promise of democracy is not perfection. The promise of democracy is accommodation and dedication to service in the best interest of the collective. The driving spirit of every thriving democracy is the shared commitment of its citizens to a covenant of public service and the pursuit of the common good rather than narrow objectives. Democracy requires active participation by an informed citizenry. It demands competence. It demands capacity and integrity from those who oversee the affairs of the state. The success of our democracy and the, pros the progress and prosperity of our nation depends on each of us knowing and operating in the knowledge that Nigeria belongs to all of us. And we each have a responsibility to build a nation and leave a legacy we can be proud of. This is our greatest and our most defining task. And it can only be achieved by our joint efforts as citizens, brothers and sisters dedicated to a cause greater than ourselves. Our destiny is not set. It is ours to choose. I believe in Nigeria and I have faith in her people. Though we may travel a hard road, we will get to the promised land. Of this, I am sure. I thank the Director General of the National Institute of Legislative and Democratic Studies, all the staff and fellows of the institutes for the vision and implementation of this lecture series. I thank all of you who have taken the time to be here today. I say God bless you and keep you all, and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria.
We can do better with that round of applause for the speaker, the Right Honorable Femi Bajabia Mila, Speaker of the House of Representatives. And very quickly, I was actually going to ask that he stays back here. But just before I do that, let me recognize very warmly the presence of the number one citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I'd like us to please recognize His Excellency Muhammadu Buhari GCFR. He'll be represented here by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation. A warm round of applause for him, please. He's been here through the lecture and also joining us as the leader of the Senate, Distinguished Senator Ibrahim Kobir, fellow Nigerian Society of Engineers, and former MDC of Ashaka Cement. We'd like to welcome your leader of the Senate. Thank you very much for coming. I'd also like to recognize very quickly the presence of May, His Royal Highness May Badi Al Haji Dr. Bakar Umar Suleiman. Please let's welcome him with a resounding applause, please. We well, thank you very much. We'll keep the recognitions coming, but it's pertinent that we run with the speed of light, taking into cognizance the exigencies of the duties of our top notch dignitaries that are here. And it is in the light of that I invite the Director General of the National Institute to please do us the honor of coming and inviting the speaker as well to do a very quick presentation of appreciation, after which we'll invite the number one citizen's remark. I'm getting a signal, but then it's understood, sir. This let's invite the guest lecturer, Your Excellency, the speaker, sir. Please do us the favor. It is my pleasure to humbly invite the special guest of honor, Mr. President, to come on the podium to present the plague to the guest lecturer. You are welcome, Your Excellency. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this plaque is presented to the speaker, Right Honorable Femi Bajabe Miller, CFR, in appreciation of his excellent services to the National Assembly and for delivering the second Distinguished Parliamentarian Lecture Series 2022, organized by the National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies. Today, Monday, 12 December 2022, congratulations, sir. After the lecture, I had the privilege of telling the speaker that truly that was a presidential inaugural address. Thank you. Let's please um, step out this way for the cameras. Thank you so much. A round of applause for the Secretary to the Government of the Federation. Thank you so much, Boss Mustafa, CFR. We appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The highlights of his presentation of that lecture